Hello everybody. Um, my name's Maria Lee. Um, I'm a professor of law here at UCL and I'm co-convener and co-editor of UCL's Current Legal Problems lecture, lecture series and publication. Um, the first volume of which was published in 1948. And my job tonight is simply to welcome you all online and in the room to UCL Faculty of Laws and also to invite you all for a drink afterwards. Um, but first, let me um, introduce the chair, Lord Justice Green. Um, he is the perfect bridge between academic thought and practice and the judiciary, um, in the tradition, I think, of CLP and indeed UCL. He has been a member of the judiciary since 2003, chair of the Law Commission since 2018. He is an honorary professor at the University of Leicester, and a former academic, and indeed I've learned a dog lover, so he's very welcome here. And with that, with um, great pleasure, I will hand proceedings over to our chair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I feel very, very old having been on the bench since 2003, actually it was 2013, so it's not quite as bad. <laughs> uh, and as for the bridge uh, with academia, uh, I spent three happy years here in the late 80s, teaching on the master's degree. When I was in practice, it was part-time, but I taught with Val Cora and a variety of others, uh, a series of uh, master's degrees in European law, including such things as European company law, European common agricultural policy law even. Such were the 1980s. But tonight, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome Sarah Green. Uh, she started life as a software coder for two years with Accenture in the late 1990s. She then rapidly moved through Birmingham University, Oxford and Bristol to the Law Commission. She has had a focus on the law of private law obligations throughout. And she arrived at the Law Commission uh, in 2000, having spent a few, year, a few months doing the transition in late 2019. Uh, and her arrival was adventitious. At that time, the Master of the Rolls, Geoffrey Voss, had just agreed to chair the United Kingdom Jurisdiction task, task Force, the UKJT. And I'd agreed with Geoffrey that in my capacity as chair of the Law Commission, I would sit on that uh, task force as an observer, as an observer, of course, to ensure that I didn't have to be bound by any conclusions they might come up with, given that it was quite possible that the commission would take over the baton from the UKJT in relation to any of their recommendations. We had to remain independent. Sarah, when she arrived, took over membership as an observer on the UKJT uh, and everything took off. We decided at that point in time that what was really needed was a 360 degree holistic view at the law relating to the digital economy. Uh, we had many discussions with the judiciary, including Jeffrey and others. We spoke to the senior commercial judges in the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, High Court, Commercial Court and Chancery Division. We took a lot of soundings. And over the last three years, Sarah has led a team at which have done some fairly, undertaken some really fairly remarkable work. She inherited a project on e-signatures. That was a small door opener, really. Moving rapidly into smart contracts, then undertaking digital assets, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, private international law, where is a, a Bitcoin, and electronic trade documents. Uh, the latter being a project causing a great deal of angst and frustration in Sarah's life as it is held up 99% complete in Parliament and we're just waiting for it to receive its final blessing before it will become one of the shortest acts in legislative history. We've developed a, a relatively nuanced approach to law reform. We recognize that, and in a sense, it's a statement of the obvious, Parliament has been somewhat distracted over the last five years, <laughs> and it continues to be. But that led us to think, why are we developing laws for Parliament? We had some very fascinating discussions with Parliamentary Council about whether we could actually develop laws through reports and persuade the judiciary that it was really a matter of common law development. And we would single out from that, that melee the minimum necessary 
requirement for legislative reform to create legal certainty. And that's what we did with electronic trade documents, a very, very short act, more philosophy than law, and even more philosophical is the work that's been undertaken by Sarah and her team, some of whom are here in the audience today, Matt, uh, on digital assets, which Sarah is going to talk about. We're looking, therefore, at scalpel-like, surgical legislative reform. And Sarah will talk about the models, I think, that we're thinking about adopting for digital assets when the report is published uh, in a couple of months' time. Now, this work that's been undertaken is paying rapid dividends. Uh, the digital assets consultation paper, you might know, was picked up in the United States. Judge Glenn in the federal New, uh, court, uh, bankruptcy court in New York in October of last year issued a quasi-practice direction in the Celsius uh, insolvency litigation relating to crypto assets, saying that since US law on the classification of a digital asset was most unclear, he was going to treat our consultation paper as indicative of US law. This was only a consultation paper, not a final report. Consultation paper, which was about 550 pages long, but I can assure you if you want to read the final report, it's just over 200. <laughs> Electronic trade documents, a short project that Sarah's team undertook, has an economic impact assessment of approximately one and a half to two billion benefit to the economy over 10 years, just by creating legal certainty. Uh, the, the, given the volume of trade relating to digital assets, the creation of legal certainty, we think, will stimulate a vast amount of trade. And this is the approach that Sarah has taken. Uh, tonight, she's talking uh, about quotes, time for a tertium quid. Before I met Sarah, I always thought that a quid was something you used to buy chocolate with. Sarah's now going to explain why I was wrong. Thank you. I don't think you can get much chocolate for a quid now. <laughs> Certainly not in Bristol. Um, I probably did this. I've just looked uh, at the uh, slide. There's a question mark missing. Because um, without the question mark, it sort of gives it away. But I, I spoil it in the first paragraph. Anyway. Um, it was supposed to be a question in my mind. And I obviously was uh, so certain about it that I forgot to put the question mark in. But um, thank you very much uh, for that, um, Nick. And it is true, it has been a very interesting time to be at the Law Commission in the good and bad senses uh, of that adjective. Um, I have had the privilege of overseeing some incredibly interesting projects and some very um, challenging technological developments. But as Nick alluded to, we have in that short time, so 2020 I started, um, I'm not that old either, 2020 I started at the Law Commission. In that time we have had... Four Lord Chancellors? Five. Five Lord Chancellors. <laughs> One of them twice. Three Prime Ministers and two monarchs. And I can honestly say I am the only Law Commissioner to have had to try to get a bill through Parliament while there have been two monarchs, at least, I think. Um, uh, so, it, yeah, it's been a very interesting time, but mostly uh, in the good sense of that word. So... Um, Time for a tertium quid. Now, I'm sure most of you know where this comes from. Um, this is the uh, now somewhat infamous uh, statement by Lord Justice Fry that all personal things are either in possession or in action and the law knows no tertium quid between the two. And just before, so to, to go back to the, the point about the bridge between um, well, various things, law commission practice, uh, and um, academia. In the months before I joined the Law Commission, I had actually started to write an article um, that was entitled Time for a Tertian Quid? Question mark. Um, and then I had the good fortune to take this on as a practical project at the Law Commission. It wasn't uh, wholly unrelated to my interests. So what I was going to do as an academic exercise, I mean, I had already thought about it for a very long time, but then I got to the Law Commission and I was very fortunate that I could pull together 
um, a very small but expert team um, of uh, lawyers, legal experts, to think about this question. And we also got, in fact, we also had to, um, but we would want to anyway, consult very widely on the question. So it was no longer simply an academic exercise in my own mind of whether I thought there should be a tertium quid. And as is the Law Commission's way, we spoke to, um, for want of a better term, end users. So the people who are using and transferring and transacting in digital assets. Um, and, and they're not necessarily lawyers. In fact, frequently they weren't. We also spoke to technologists, to those who were developing the platform, who were working um, in making these assets. Uh, we spoke, as Nick has said, we spoke to the judiciary, the senior judiciary, um, about our ideas. Uh, and we spoke to a lot of academics, and some of those people are in this room and maybe online today. I can't see who's online, so sorry, I can't say for definite. But if you, uh, we spoke to an awful lot of people. People are incredibly generous with their time and expertise. Um, and it made for a very interesting uh, project. And as Nick said, the final report is going to be due out, um, or is due out, I should say, is going to be out this summer. So what I am going to do this evening um, is talk about my ideas for a tertium quid, and I will also make it very clear uh, how they relate to the Law Commission position. And that's not just because my sort of boss is chairing um, <laughs> this, this evening, I would have done it anyway. I also have to make the point very clear that the final report has not yet been through peer review of commissioners. So anything I do say about that Law Commission position is um, uh, provisional. I don't uh, anticipate that it will it will change hugely, but it is not the final final report law commission position. Um, but as I said, I've already spoilt it. It is time for a tertium quid. Uh, that's where I'm going to end up, and that is also uh, pretty much where the law commission um, report ends up as well. And as I said, that was this parallel process of talking about these ideas and talking about the arguments um, with lots of stakeholders all coming at it from different perspectives and having both practical, academic, uh, and, and in some cases, uh, judicial views. Um, so I'm going to talk today really about the reasoning behind this. I know it is a controversial statement. It's actually probably more controversial in academia than it is in any of those other spheres that I have talked about. I was quite surprised when I engaged in that consultation process, how many, um, certainly legal advisors, uh, were um, open and encouraging of uh, the creation of a new category, um, a, a tertium quid, as it were, although we don't really use that terminology when we're in those uh, discussions. So I think the most interesting question is, um, or one of the most interesting questions, is also very uh, difficult to answer, at least when you're coming to this new, and that is why now? Because, of course, uh, we have known these, uh, or personal property lawyers have known this dichotomy for such a long time. And it's always been fine, and we've never really had to ask these questions before. And yet society and the economy have seen huge changes. It's not as if we've all be, always been dealing with the same things and that we have fitted in these categories. We've had the emergence of, of bank money. We've had intermediated securities. You know, there have been an awful lot of changes. And it's only really in relatively recent times, probably the last two decades, or certainly that's um, when I've been thinking about it, where these questions have really come to the fore. And actually, uh, Nick mentioned that I started life... Uh, oh, I didn't start life. I wasn't there. <laughs> I started my professional life as a, um, as a, uh, as a, as a coder. And I worked doing um, data conversion for Sony. We were building this, and this really does age me, we were building the first B2C consumer website for Sony to sell their PlayStation. So before that, you couldn't buy anything online. You certainly couldn't buy a PlayStation online. And I was building, or part of a team that built this uh, website. And I remember thinking, so I'd come from my, my law degree, and then I was working, doing this data conversion and building this website. And I remember thinking, this, this is going to be really problematic for lawyers because I could see the use of data, the increased use of data, and its manifestation in 
uh, a form that wasn't quite transient. I'm not going uh, to talk too much about that at this stage. But so, so that's what alerted me. And so when I went back to uh, law uh, and legal life uh, in an academic sense, that's why I was so interested uh, in these questions. So why now? And, and it's really moved on hugely, I would say, in the past 10 years, um, uh, because technology has essentially allowed the digital replication of things which previously could only exist in a very obvious physical, tangible way. Um, but don't worry, I'm going to say uh, a bit more about that. What it means, and this is why the tertium quid thing I think is the way to go, is that we now have in digital or electronic form or virtual form, I mean those, those words are used quite inter interchangeably and I know they're not all strictly accurate depending on what we're talking about. Um, but what it means is that we now have these things, and I use that now in a whole lot more than I ever did before. I was always told by my English teacher never to use it because it wasn't specific enough and that's exactly why I'm using it now. Um, so these things, um, are not quite things in action and they're not quite things in possession. And again, I'm using things there because um, I know it's, it, it started off as shows, but I've had that beaten out of me at the Law Commission and told to use um, more accessible language. So things, that is probably what I will, what I will be saying uh, this evening. So I just wanted to um, explain that because there were certainly a few questions at the judicial seminar as to why I was using things in action and not shows in action. Um, but they're not quite either of those things, I don't think. They're, they're not quite. Sometimes they behave like things in possession, and sometimes they behave like things in action. Um, and sometimes they don't quite behave like either. And so whilst I, and there will be people um, listening to this who, who have heard me, well, some people in this room, bless them, have heard me say all of this before. Um, but people might remember that my original academic position a long time ago was that actually these digital things are just things in possession. And I explained why and said they should be treated like things in possession. And then through probably Law Commission consultation, through talking to the other lawyers on my team, it actually became clearer to me that a tertian quid was a, was a better way of, rather than trying to shoehorn them, into things in possession, even though they're quite often like that, it just seemed to me, to us, to be um, a sort of conceptually cleaner idea to start again with a category that could be better tailored to what these things um, actually are. Now, of course, it's all very well and good saying sometimes they're this, sometimes they're that. But of course, as lawyers, we need to be very clear about when those things occur and when we do need to classify um, things. So what I am going to talk about in the time that is left to me is really the two, the two characteristics and their conclusion. So what it is about these new things that mean um, that a tertium quid is the way forward. And they are, one, these things exist independently of persons and the legal system. And again, I will uh, explain exactly what I mean by that. And the second is that they are rivalrous in nature. Um, and what, what does this mean for their legal uh, analysis and why is it important? And I think these are two characteristics, and these are what we've, we've really tested with a lot of consultees. Um, there's been broad agreement on the fact that these are the things that are important uh, about these uh, digital assets. And these are the things that are salient in terms of their legal treatment. Um, now, independence from persons in the legal system, I mean, you know, we, we didn't pluck these ideas out of, the, out of the ether, certainly, and some of you may well think that this um, chimes with what James Penner has written uh, about uh, property in terms of his separability thesis. So independence is important because, and it's not quite the same as his separability thesis, but it's certainly not a million miles away, that independence is important because these things um, are uh, separate from persons. So, um, I mean, he refers quite often to, to body parts, so of course uh, separability would um, mean that you included sleeves in that thing but 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 not arms because of course they are not um separable from persons in the general run of things um 
But that, I mean, that, that, is, that is important. And, and this is a context dependent argument, as so much of this is. And it's in fact what has led us in the Law Commission report um, and, the, and the consultation paper. Well, I'll just stick with the report for now to save complicating things. Um, has led us to an approach which is not so much bright line. It's absolutely independent. It's absolutely rivalrous. Therefore, it goes in tertium quid. And if it doesn't meet those bright line distinctions, it's out. We've taken more of an approach, which is these two things that I've mentioned, independence, rivalrousness, are core characteristics. And the closer, obviously, that something is to meeting those, the more certain it is it's within the tertium quid category. And of course, then there are going to be gray areas and borderline issues. But of course, that's the same with with any sort of property. Um, and I'll give some examples of that um, in uh, a minute. And it's certainly true for body parts because of course they are technically separable. And of course, as we know from case law at Yearworth and, and Bristol NHS Trust, um, which for those of you who don't know was the case about the um, uh, cancer patient sperm that was stored so that they could use it after their treatment and it was stored um, at, a, a, at the wrong temperature, so it was destroyed. And then there was a question of, is that a breach of a bailment? Uh, and in order to be that, obviously the sperm would have had to be deemed property and the court said, yes, it was for those purposes. And that has to be right because clearly we don't want, I mean, it's a policy decision, isn't it? But we don't want to say in general terms, you can have property and body parts because we don't want to allow or encourage um, a black market in kidneys. But there are uh, examples, and Yearworth is a really good one, of, ex of, of contexts where we do want there to be the protection of property law. Um, so the other example I quite often use is a, is a donor organ in an ambulance that, that, you know, that then gets, that gets stolen. And if the law's conclusion was, well, that's not theft because you can't have property in a heart, well, that's um, not necessarily very satisfactory. So independence is important in two principal ways. Excuse me. The first is that that thing can be transferred completely away from one individual and to another. And what is really in important about independence for my current purposes is it's independence from persons. I've talked about that. Also independence from the legal system. And that is to distinguish those things which exist anyway regardless of whether the law recognises a right in relation to them, or indeed whether the law recognises them at all. And um, to give you the sort of the, the most obvious contrast there, take a laptop. Now, of course, a laptop, I can't see one, I want to point one, but anyway, a, a, a computer obviously exists in the world. Whether a legal system recognises it or not, it's there, it has a physical existence. And of course, that's very different to a debt. Um, a debt is just a thing in action, by which I mean it is entirely dependent for its existence on legal recognition or and or claims by persons. It has no existence separate and independent of those things. If we didn't have a legal system, if we all got wiped off the face of the earth tomorrow, debts wouldn't be a thing. But depending on the apocalyptic event, plastic things might still exist. So they're not dependent on, on persons, and, and that's the sort of independence that I'm talking about. So a debt is, its whole existence is coextensive with the rights in it. But of course, a laptop is not. It is, its existence is anterior to the rights that we might have in it. Now, have I got time for this little tangent? Um, probably not, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I do want to make one uh, very small tangential point. It is important, though, and that is that I'm not here, and this came up in consultation, um, not least the judicial <laughs> consultation roundtable, that the suggestion of this tertium quid is not that it's thereby exhaustive and um, overrides other property rights that might, for instance, be recognised um, in statutes. So I'm distinguishing this from intellectual property rights. So by saying tertium quid, we're not saying that thereby, you know, we, we exhaust the field and intellectual property rights are, are, are still very much, obviously, uh, a thing and very important. But they're also absolutely separate. I ha I've heard the argument so often, less so recently, actually, um, 
But about five or six years ago, it was, it was an argument that was made to me very often that, well, we don't need personal property rights in these things because intellectual property rights will protect what's necessary. And I, I just have always found that quite a baffling argument because um, if you, I, don't, I don't know why it gets applied to digital things when it doesn't get applied to um, conventionally tangible things. So if I, say, have a copy of the law of personal property, um, now, I don't have intellectual property rights in that book, uh, and so I can't, you know, exploit those for my own gain. They don't belong to me. That's not what I wanted when I purchased the book. But of course, I do have personal property rights in my copy of that book. And if somebody takes that physical book from me and deprives me of it, then I have a right, and I should have a right. Uh, and they're different, the exchange value and the use value. Now, you might be all thinking that this is a very facile point to make and why am I even making it? Because even to non-lawyers, I think that would be obvious. But it is an illusion that's so often made with digital. If I, have a, if I buy that digital book, because digital books are often licensed, the argument goes, oh, well, you know, that's a different arrangement. But it doesn't stop the fact that you can buy, certainly now that we've got um, non-fungible uh, digital things, I'm back to that word, um, there is no reason why your personal property rights can't be and shouldn't be protected as well as somebody else's intellectual property rights in that thing. I could talk about that phrase, but I'm not going to because it's not really the focus of my paper tonight. But it is, um, it is a very important uh, point to make. So why does um, independence matter? Um, where do we get to? An independent thing in not being inextricably bound to any individual in the world is transferable. And obviously, we all know um, why that's important for property. But I think the really key thing about these two characteristics, so independence and rivalrousness, I've, I was thinking for years, really, you know, what, trying to extrapolate what is it about conventional goods that these new digital things replicate in a factual sense. And independence and rivalrousness um, mean that that thing, and how does it distinguish those things from things in action, that thing is involuntarily alienable. So it can factually be taken away from you without your consent, without your being involved at all, in that transaction. And that, I think, is what brings us to the tertium quid, certainly brings me to the tertium quid. These things which have that vulnerability and therefore need, and I would say deserve, um, personal uh, property protection. Now, it's very important at this stage, and, and we've certainly found this um, difficult, as, as I know other groups have, um, to, make, to maintain the distinction between the factual and the legal. And what I'm talking about here is very much a factual situation. So something that is independent from me can be involuntarily alienated, can be taken without my consent. So my car, you, somebody could come and drive my car away without my consent, I would, that would be factually then alienated from me. Um, you can't do that, of course, with a debt. Of course, debts are alienable, but not really in an involuntary sense in that factual way, um, as we've seen in, um, well, in lots, but, but, but um, this is the, the, the very obvious um, outcome of case law, which compares things in action uh, and things in possession. Now, when we talk about the sorts of assets that go in the tertium quid, they too are involuntary, involuntarily alienable because they are independent and because they are rivalrous. Um, okay. Uh, so, the other point that I want to make about this is that the involuntary alienation point, I mean, is that historically, as we all know, the discussion has been very much one of tangibility versus intangibility. And that is still a real sticking point, not least because people disagree, actually, on whether these digital assets um, are indeed tangible or intangible. Now, I realise I've talked about digital assets a lot. I mean, I, ha I haven't given any examples, but 
Um, certainly those that, that we refer to in the Law Commission work and they're probably the ones that most people are thinking of. So NFTs, um, obviously some sort of, uh, or, or any sort of uh, cryptocurrency, tokens on a ledger which represent something in the real world, whether that's a diamond or a bottle of wine or a cow. Because of course these blockchains are used to um, show the provenance of, of, of food, so you know where your food's coming from. Um, and the, those are the, the, the digital assets um, that we're talking about. And the argument has often been, well, they're intangible. And, you know, we saw that in cases like famous House of Lords um, judgment in, in OBG and Allen, that things in action um, cannot be uh, susceptible to conversion um, because they are intangible and cannot be possessed. Now, I actually think that the intangible, tangible distinction is a red herring. There is disagreement about whether these things are tangible or not. I actually don't think that they are intangible, personally. Um, I should make that very clear, that's my personal view. Um, because at some level, they do exist. We can't perceive it with the unaided senses, um, but a, a, a piece of hardware with software on is different at some level, some physical molecular level to a piece of hardware with a different piece of software on. So that would be my view. And that is very different to a purely ideational construct like a debt or an idea, which is absolutely uh, ethereal. I also don't think it matters. So that's why I'm not going to talk about it at length. I think intangible, tangible sort of grew into a proxy for possessable, non-possessable, simply because for years and years and years, centuries and centuries, everything we wanted to possess was tangible. And we never really thought about those things um, in terms of possession that were intangible, such as ideas. Whereas, as I said, we're now at a stage where technology gives us things which we can, that look a lot like possession, our relationship to them looks a lot like possession, but we can't actually see them with the unaided senses. So I think um, that is the problem. So independence is what matters, but for centuries that was hidden from view uh, and, and was elided uh, with um, tangibility. OK, uh, so rivalrousness, this is the second point. Um, we're not wild about this word. I've never been wild about this word, um, but I cannot. And in many, many consultation meetings, I would say to people, if you've got a better one, please uh, tell us. And nobody yet has come up with one, but I'm still open to ideas. We've probably got a couple of weeks, haven't we, Matt, before we can. Uh, um, but rivalrousness, I mean, it, 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 it says what we want it to say. It, it's just not the most uh, accessible of uh, terms. And What's important, I think, about those things that go in the tertium coin is something has to be independent and rivalrous because um, there are all sorts of things which are independent. So take your obvious Word document example. Clearly, that is independent from persons. But in most configurations, that's not rivalrous because I've got my uh, lecture written here and I could send a copy to all of you and we'd all have one. And of course, that's that's not rivalrous um, at all. Um, whereas digital objects now can be. Uh, you know, distributed ledger technology has enabled us, amongst other things, to get over the double spend problem. We can now very much, and can is important because, you know, digital assets are not one homogenous whole by any means. It, it, it needs to be, uh, the law needs to look at those assets for their own particular characteristics and according to their own particular context. It's no, there's no good really just talking about digital assets as if it's just um, one big bubble. Um, so rivalrousness is important because uh, it's, I think, the biggest distinction from and I'm looking at the time, so I know how long I've got to, to talk about this biggie, which is it distinguishes them from pure information. And, you know, we all know it's, I mean, most, uh, I was going to say most law students know. Um, it, it, it's quite a, um, a sort of trite proposition that information, um, pure information in the Oxford and Moss sense, is not something um, that can be a subject of a property right in that sense, because it is purely ideational. It is definitely uh, not rivalrous. If I have an idea or knowledge in my head and I pass it on to Nick, um, he's now got it, but it's shared, it's not been transferred. I cannot divest myself of it. 
normally in recent weeks, actually, I do, I do seem to be able to divest myself of quite a few ideas and information. But in the general run of things, that's still in my head. So, you know, the Oxford and Moss um, criminal law case takes exam paper, absorbs the uh, civil engineering questions on it, I think it was, um, puts the paper back. It's not theft because the paper's back and the information which isn't rivalrous um, cannot be a subject of a property right. Now, digital assets are not just information um, or certainly uh, are not necessarily just information. They have a rivalrousness um, which sets them apart from that and this is why they go within a tertium quid in my view and in the view of the Law Commission um, because they um, exhibit this characteristic. Now, I'll come back to that point I made about core characteristics that I don't think you can't say of anything, certainly nothing that occurs to me at the moment. I should probably have thought about that before I um, put it in the lecture. But um, there's, there's very few things and probably none that you can say are absolutely rivalrous or non-rivalrous. So obviously, if I eat an apple, you can't eat the apple, but I could eat half the apple and give you the other half of the apple and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the point is uh, that the quality of rivalrousness is something which is a very strong indicia of whether something can and should be uh, classified um, as property. So uh, why are digital assets um, rivalrous in that way and why are they not like information? So I'll give you the, um, the sort of most obvious example of a digital asset that when I talk to people who are not steeped in this stuff and haven't thought about it a lot, if I talk about digital assets, they presume I'm talking about digital currencies or NFTs. Um, and of course, that's a very important category of digital assets. Um, but it is worth pointing out, because this is um, a point that gets presented a lot, why those things are more than information and why they are um, indeed rivalrous. Um, I think the easiest way to do that is to use a, a simplified sort of model of uh, what a digital currency uh, looks like. So if you um, imagine that um, your unit of digital, and I'm being deliberately generic here because of course they all do work slightly differently, but for the sake, for this point, the, the, the argument holds across the board. So each token or unit you imagine as a sort of alphanumeric string of, of data. Um, in much the same way as you have an al alphanumeric string of data on a banknote. I haven't seen a banknote for a fair while, but I do uh, remember they all have these serial numbers on them. Um, and of course, what, what you do with a banknote, as you all know, uh, is that it's no good to you just to remember the serial number. You also have to have the serial number on the banknote, on the physical manifestation, which you can then spend, which gives you this um, transactional power. And actually, digital, um, so, so a crypto uh, coin um, is not so different to that. It's an alphanumeric string of data, but if you just memorize the alphanumeric string of data that, that was somebody else's, say, Bitcoin, it would do you no good. It is, it is not just the information that gives you that transactional spending power. And of course, if that were the case, if you could just have the sort of brain that, that would um, memorize those alphanumeric strings of data, it would not be rivalrous and everyone could spend it. But the point is, that is not enough. You need to have that data manifested within the system. And those two things together then give you the completed asset. And there are all sorts of ways to maintain the rivalrousness of that, the most obvious one being um, uh, the sort of password equivalent, having a private key which gives you and only you access to that data manifest on the system and then the ability to spend it. And it's that rivalrousness that new technology, I suppose distributed ledger, ledger technology is the most scalable um, example of that, it has allowed these digital assets to be rivalrous in a way that wasn't really possible, at least at scale,
before and we didn't think about Word documents being rivalrous. rivalrous. We don't need them to be. In fact, it's actually very handy that they're not. Um, so that's why this sort of new generation of technology has given rise to these questions um, that it didn't uh, before. Um, I've got an eye on the time. What time did I start? I know originally I was supposed to finish now, but my... We start at least five minutes. Okay, okay. Um, I might not need an, 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 enti an entire um, five minutes. Um, so all of those things together, we have these characteristics of um, digital assets, which means that as, um, certainly as I think, and this again is the, the, the position in the Law Commission report, that if something is independent of persons and the legal system, and it is rivalrous and exhibits rivalrousness, um, then it is involuntarily alienable in a way that things in action aren't. So why can't we just, as was my original idea, and I don't mean just mine, but it was certainly what I used to think quite a few years ago, why can't we then um, just put them in the things in possession box uh, and save ourselves a lot of work, basically, just you know, shoehorn them into that category um, and, and deal with it that way. And there's, there's a lot, I mean, I'm not going to be able to go through all the reasons in, in the time that I have left, but I think um, I've already alluded to, to the sort of high level principle, which is, but why do that? You know, what, if, it's, if it wasn't, you know, those two crack categories grew up for very good reason um, alongside a certain category, a, a certain type or, or array of types uh, of things. Uh, and, and they served that purpose incredibly well for centuries. Um, and so there isn't really an obvious argument, I suppose, uh, for manipulating the boundaries of those in a way that feels quite artificial. I mean, apart from the instinctive response of a lot of particularly academic lawyers that, you know, you can't, you can't touch, touch what, what was said um, in these old cases. Um, you know, why would we want to, to change these boundaries now? Aside from that, I'm not saying that's not important, but aside from that, there doesn't seem to me to be an obvious reason. And if I just give you one uh, example of, because I get this question asked of me quite a lot. So you say they're, they're not quite things in possession. Why are they not quite things in possession? Well, um, I think the obvious and most visual example for me is the transfer of a digital asset. So if we go back again to my highly simplified, um, and well, generic description of um, a cryptocurrency transaction, in many ways, cryptocurrency is, is more like cash than it's like bank money in the sense that once it's gone, it's gone. You know, if you lose your private keys, it's, it's not a debt against someone that they can just, um, you know, refill the, the fund. If you lose your private keys, if you lose access or, what, you know, whatever means of access, it is gone. So in that sense, it is like um, cash. But of course, the real difference from cash is, is the physical. So we go back to that factual uh, description of the situation, physical transfer of these assets is very different to transferring cash. And this is again back to that idea of it's physical at some level, but we, we can't touch it and hold it and pass it on. And there is certainly a common view that what is happening when you're transferring digital currencies is you're extinguishing one thing and recreating another. So again, there, it's, it's a bit more like we're back to bank money. So you're extinguishing um, one uh, debt and creating another. So you've got a sort of novation position. Now, again, it, it is more complicated than that and there are more views on it. But that, I, think, I think that's quite a nice illustration, that transfer, even though we're talking about these things that are independent and rivalrous, they're not transferred in exactly the same obvious physical way as if I were to hand this watch to somebody uh, or, or, you know, indeed hand anything that is conventionally tangible. I really do think I should probably um, stop there, but I am more than happy to um, elaborate on any of that. Um, we've got 500 pages worth that we can talk about or that I can talk about. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I'll leave it there for now and uh, yeah, happy to elaborate or answer any questions. So let's see, are there any burning questions? Yes. Well, thank you very much for that, um, Sarah. Most illuminating, and you probably know I don't really agree with you on much of this. So I would um, start by saying, and this is perhaps more of a statement than a question, that I haven't seen any great resistance to the treatment of certain assets as proprietary in character as a result of Lord Justice Fry's, may I say, famous uh, dichotomy uh, in the 1880s. So the practical question, what is to be achieved by this, I think needs to be answered. Now what concerned me a little bit, I won't go on for too long, was your statement about certain uh, crypto and similar assets being uh, akin to things in possession. And there's a statement of Erdus Bevin shortly after the Second World War. <coughs> um, for the sake of anybody who wasn't around at the time, a very famous foreign secretary. And he said, the danger with opening Pandora's box is you don't know how many Trojan horses will leap out. <laughs> so now, what worries me is that by introducing this third category, you're running um, your conversion horse in the proprietary stakes. You're seeking to uh, make the case for uh, a widespread expansion of rights in relation to uh, certain categories of property. And it bothers me uh, because we don't quite know what the consequences of this would be if we fed it right through the, the system. So I'm worried about that and I don't really see myself as reconnaissant of certain assets as being possessory in character <clears throat> that by special statute, for example, the Financial Collateral Directive, they are treated as though they could be possessed when to a common lawyer, the notion of such abstract securities being capable of possession is more or less anathema. And uh, a common lawyer would also understand that for various uh, pragmatic purposes in the civil law, for example, the civil lawyer's resistance to non-proprietary, non-possessory security, they have artificially been treated as susceptible to possession. So that's perhaps as much as I should say, and it's more of a, a statement and a, a last-ditch call. And I would wonder too how, if it ever comes to it, and perhaps it wouldn't, the Office of the Parliamentary Draftsman would get its collective head around this notion of a tertium quid. <laughs> so for me, it's uh, a question of why do you need a third wheel on the proprietary bicycle? It's a, it's a really interesting one. You might actually just explain some of the discussions we've had with Parliamentary Council about this. I will. I will. But um, I'm very glad you asked that, actually, Michael, because that was something I wanted to talk about and, uh, and didn't. Did I actually mention conversion? Did I manage to go a whole lecture without mentioning conversion, or did I mention it? I mentioned it. Okay. But, but this is not actually driven by my um, ideas about conversion. I was trying not to mention it at all. Um, but it, it, the, the important point from what you've said is, uh, and I missed this out, um, certainly in terms of what the Law Commission report does, is actually make the point at the outset that we're not really creating anything. Um, and one of the recognitions that we make early on, and that was clear well, from our research and from speaking to stakeholders, is this, that, that this already happens. Um, and that there are certain things in the world, uh, like European um, emissions allowances, the um, Armstrong case, where a proprietary analysis is in fact uh, given by the common law to certain things, where it ticks certain boxes. And so really, that's the first thing to say. And so what are we adding here we feel like what we're doing here and what needs to be recognised is making that a bit more concrete and actually in, 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 sort of in the direction of your concerns, obviously as soon as you put um, a framework on something, it, doesn't, it, it can also stop it being excessively 
expansionist. So obviously in saying that we've got this new category and in having these core characteristics, we're certainly not in the business of saying, right, now everything that, whatever it is, it can be possessed or controlled and you know it can be the subject of a proprietary analysis. We're, we're actually trying to avoid that and to create some certain boundaries so that you know, commercial lawyers can be happy that we've got this certainty um, with flexibility built in. And there are certainly limits to, to what we're, we're saying. So if you take um, a security that is not manifested in a way which ticks these boxes, then as a result of what we're suggesting, um, we're not sort of uh, positing possessibility onto everything that doesn't meet those criteria. So those are those two things. And as I said, I should have said that at the start, actually, um, that we're not suggesting that this is something that we're creating out of the blue and that actually there has already been quite a lot of recognition in the common law for things which don't quite fit those two categories. Although in a couple of cases, um, the judge's concern, so certainly Lord Justice Moore Bick at one stage, um, you know, made an appeal for for Parliament to, to step in and, and, and create certainty here because I think he was partly um, convinced by the arguments that there should be more expansion but felt that it was too um, great a leap perhaps for, for the courts to do on their own. So Parliamentary Council, um, yeah, this is, yeah, I mean, if you, if you, if anybody, um, even Parliamentary Council, who are of course immensely impressive individuals, um, was asked to draft a statute for this. Or, or a provision, a, a, a clause, a section eventually of this, it would be very, very difficult. And what was really interesting was we always had in mind um, throughout most of the project that if we were going to suggest legislation here, it would be incredibly minimalist. So I've described it in the past as being, well, this is the Electronic Trade Documents Act, but it, 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 it um, applies even more strongly here, which would be laparoscopic legal surgery. So what we would be doing is and other jurisdictions have not done this and they have produced you know pages and pages of, of of legislation which we think would be counterproductive not only would it make any sane person want to lie down in a darkened room um but it would also be obsolete very quickly it would also obviously just create so many hostages to fortune but the one thing that we think or we thought would be helpful would be a clarificatory unblocker um so and of course i'm not drafting here but uh, digital assets, I mean, this is absolutely terrible draft, but the, the, the thinking we had was something along the lines of digital assets, um, you know, can be uh, property in the right circumstances with the with this spin of a parliamentary council's proper drafting on that. And then we had a, a round table with the judiciary, we've already mentioned a couple of times, and we asked them, um, so we had how many? 40 or 50. 40 or 50, senior. 40, 73, yeah. And so we talked to them about what we we're proposing to do, because of course what we what we really are doing is handing the baton to them because we say you know common law development we've got this guidance that we've put together in this final report but it basically it's over to you now what do you think about that um and they they were very encouraging and actually very keen on the idea of a clarificatory sort of one-liner unblocker which sort of gave them then the license to do all the necessaries all the hard bits basically but that they would have that clarification. And it was, I think, their suggestion now, I think it originally, um, uh, it had been in the, it had been on, on our radar, but the, the judges were very keen on a um, negatively phrased provision along the lines of digital assets should not be denied proprietary recognition simply by virtue of the fact that they're a digital or electronic, you know, but that, that phrasing. And they were very keen on having that um, as a basis from which then they could uh, develop all the, as I said, all the hard stuff, really. That was a very long answer. But we have, we're not a million miles from, from you, but we started with the idea that we needed to say, this is the third category, it has these conditions. And we're now moving to, if you find some digital value which has these conditions, it's not precluded from being property. And we're very concerned to ensure technology neutrality. You don't want to do something which will in five years time, there will be some sort of asset which nobody's thought about, which doesn't fit within the definition. Uh, and this was the, the flash of genius that a number of the judges came up with. We had a flurry of emails afterwards where they were all competitive drafting. 
and we handed it to parliamentary council who shook her head and said, <laughs> I'm going to have to go away and do a lot of work. But, but three years ago, I asked Douglas Hall, who was parliamentary council with us at the time, and as a joke, he went away over a weekend and came back with a beautifully framed piece of legislation called the Thingy Act. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not, we're not that far from it. <laughs> No, but we, I mean, we certainly don't think that that's necessary. Um, yeah. You know, I think that, com- but, but if, it's, if it's a comfort and if it's, a, you know, if it provides this sort of s- skeletal certainty, then we might be Isn't able to persuade parliamentary case. Am I allowed to say that? Anyway, I don't know if that no, works. That's, yes, that's yes. I've had the microphone, but I, and I won't give it up. But I thought I, well, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, I, for anyone who did who's in the room who doesn't know, um, I've just been very involved in a Unidra project. So in other words, pro- uh, digital assets of the world, if you like, a project for pro- uh, principles in relation to digital assets um, for you know, any country who, who wants to um, uh, 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 comply with what we would say are, are sort of global standards. And um, one of our, well, our main principle is digital assets can be the subject of proprietary rights. And we've had, we put it like that so that it sort of works for the civil lawyers as well as the, the common lawyers. Um, so I suppose there are two questions. I mean, one is under English law, is the fact that it doesn't fit very happily and things in possession or things in action mean it can't be the subject of proprietary rights? And if you decide that you do want it to be the subject of proprietary rights, then you either have to put it in one of the categories or you have to find a new category. But uh, the, my, my, my question, I suppose, such as it is, is, is what we found is that, of course, civil law countries are even keener on categories Mm. than than we are. And many of them have a problem because they have kind of tangibles. And I don't Mm. think they would, Mm. most of them would like your argument that (laughs) digital assets were tangibles. Um, And they have claims. And so they have the same sort of problem. And I think one of the things that that, that this reasoning might help do is, is, and I mean, they're already thinking about it, many of them, is is helping the civil law countries as well to, to, to work out how they're going to approach this. What we said in the unit of principles is, well, you've got to get to the stage where digital assets can be subject to proprietary rights. It's up to you, state, to go away and think about which category, if you need a category, it falls into. Yeah. It's problematic. You have to deem something to be in a category. and It might not quite naturally fit there. And um, th- th- this, is in, this is why we're moving away from some rigidity to avoid impinging upon technical neutrality in the future. Oh, I should say, by the way, that Unidraw Principle was also very techni- technologically neutral, yeah, try to be. Of and I, th- I, th- I think that's really important. I mean, we've been doing, doing this for four years, as you have, I think, and already things have changed a great deal. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's been very, as you know, well know, Louise, but the people might not, that we've worked alongside uh, Unidraw. So we, we haven't done these, um, we haven't formulated these thoughts in a vacuum by any means. And it has been really, really helpful to see how other jurisdictions... Um, have to think about it and have to approach it. Yes, and then one and two. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I, I and the economy, th- thank you for the work that, that, that you've done. Um, I think uh, just a starting point that the, the old definition between shows in possession and shows in action w- was never satisfactory. And it's become ha- hagiographed and, and, and deified for entirely unjustifiable reasons. The, the simple fact is that there was never enough value in shows in action to anybody to, for anybody to litigate it. And when you don't have enough value in, in objects of possession, nobody fights about things. And they just become accepted because, oh, well, we had this argument a couple of hundred years ago when there was a little bit of value in it. And nobody's bothered ever since. So thank you for, for modernizing the law. Like you... I find rivalrousness just unsatisfactory as a as a writer, if if not as a as a lawyer. You mean the word or the concept? Yes, yes, the it's, it's, yeah, it's a word, bit yeah. it's a bit clunky. Yeah. Can, can we make? Could you make ex- exclusivity work as an alternative? That's just the thought. We um, I think we started with exclusivity actually, um, but of course, then you have to. Um, then you have to make it very clear that, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think they mean exactly the same thing, do they? Um, because you can have, you, you can share in something and it can still be exclusive. So it's singular, you know, it's not necessarily singular, is it? Whereas rivalrousness get, just gets closer to that singularity, to the, um, the essence of it all, which is, you know, trying to avoid any 
um, well, well, anything that isn't singular, really. So, yeah, we started off, or certainly we, we considered ex exclusivity along the way, and I do prefer it as a word, but I don't think it quite says the same thing. I mean, I've thought <laughs> ridiculous about, about this word. I mean, there might be one in another language um, that probably is in German um, that just does it absolutely perfectly and, and that we can, we can borrow. And I'd be quite happy to adopt it. So if anybody uh, knows of one, even in another language, we'd, we'll take it. Over here and then. Um, can I ask about, about thinginess? Um, yeah. and, and specifically, if, if we were identify one of these things and choose your favourite, what exactly is it that we are treating as being the object of proprietary rights? I, I don't think it's sufficient to say digital asset because it, it tells us nothing about the... So, um, how, pre how precisely would you want to define or would you demand the definition of the, the object of the, the right and, and how might you define it? I think um, that's quite a hard question but it's not quite as hard as conflicts which I thought you might be asking me about so I'm quite relieved. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, well, the obvious get out on that is that one of the reasons we deliberately don't define this, and I do mean that it's deliberate, is that um, we want to provide certainty, but we want to leave the flexibility for the common law to consider each of these situations in its own fact-specific way, and that we certainly don't want to dictate now what exactly those things are going to look like in 10 years' time. At the moment, what I would say is the sort of root... Um, the, the sort of simplest, most basic manifestation of the thing which whose relationship with the individual gives you the value, gives you the power of what you want. So in terms of the um, token that I was talking about and the alphanumeric data, which is, of course, an identifier which points you to the thing that gives you the power to spend, it's the thing, not the identifier, that I would say personally, is what we're talking about in terms of the asset. But um, we deliberately don't go to that level of granularity because to do so, I think, would mean that our suggestions would very soon be distinguishable and no longer as, use, as much use as the, the approach that we've taken, which is to identify characteristics which can then be um, massaged I think yeah, I, mean, I just uh, um, I think this is really hard. And um, yeah. when you were speaking about rivalness, you spoke about the, the, the string of alphanumeric code. It can't be that. No, it's I not. Mean, that's it, the it, identifier. It can't be. That's the identifier. But it, then the, you, you ask the question: Well, what a, what exactly is it that it's it's identifying? And I I thought and thought and thought about this, and I don't have a clear answer to. It. And I wonder whether uh, the sort of criterion of identifiability um, or uh, the ability to describe what it is that the pr is, is also important but I have I've come to but no then then we'd probably it. never get anything within the category <laughs> yes yes hello um, as an ex investment banker and I emphasize ex I'm going to point out two attributes of that profession one is that it's populated by intensely clever people and two, or some would say even leaders, and two, they are interested in making a lot of money from other people. That, by way of backdrop, is what I want to point out. And now I move on to my comment. Have you thought about the total quid creating a third category such that those investment bankers will find some way, and this is the law of unintended consequences that Michael was alluding to, to transforming massive contemporary asset classes into that third category to extract advantage from unsuspecting and unwary. Well, yeah, I mean, we've, we've always obviously got uh, an eye on um, what, what is likely to be done in the real world with what it is that we're um, suggesting. And as I said at the beginning, that's one of the reasons why we've made sure that we have spoken to as many 
different contingents of people who are going to be interested, who are going to be using, who are going to be subject to this um, as possible. And that, of course, is clearly something that's at the top of our, um, our list to consider uh, at all times. But um, I mean, I'll go back to um, what I said in answer to Michael, really, is that uh, the danger of not providing any certainty and any limits um, to this asset class is you well I would say it is a greater risk you know because at least by doing this we are delimiting it and we're not um, and this is something else that has been presented to us several times is that we're not making any um, particularly sort of normative uh, uh, suggestion about what people should do with their wealth and we're obviously certainly not making um, uh, any sort of investment uh, advice but when you put these boundaries on things that can also and we are hoping will reduce the ability for things which shouldn't be classified in that way to be so as a simple example today a certain company that's listed today would transform all of its share capital into some form of ledger based token that would have an you know, total lot of consequences that's the sort of thing I think that they are already it's a down isn't it and they are so by bringing in this new um, by bringing in uh, a legal framework, shall we say, that's highly flexible, you're opening up the potential for those currently well understood assets to go through a period of intense instability as the value. Well, I mean, as I said, I think the, the argument goes both ways. I mean, bringing in a legal framework, I think, reduces that risk as much as, you know, it, otherwise it's at large. Uh, and at the moment, because there is so much uncertainty around what can be classed as a certain thing and what can't, then I don't, I don't think that what we're doing is actually increasing that risk at all because we are at least providing um, these uh, foundations, I suppose, and, and, and walls for what goes in a certain classification and, and what doesn't. And again, we're not saying that once things are in this category that they're always going to be good things and they're always going to be just able to be used for anybody's uh, um, gain. What we're saying is they're going to be subject to a proprietary analysis. And of course, um, that protects as much as it gives people incentive to make money. It, it also has the, the other. You have to remember, we talk a lot to the Bank of England and the FCA and Sarah's team do. We're doing some elemental, it's quasi philosophical, you know, legal certainty creation. It's up to the regulators then to work out the consequences. And the other thing to note is that we're probably two or three or four years behind the technologists. It's the law catching up. It already exists, it happens. They don't understand why they should be regulated. We create a legal framework and we say to the bank or the FCA, you get on and now sort out the details for your naughty bankers. So I think there's a question over there then, a woman just in front of us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just in terms of the tensions that are obvious in, in this conversation, I was just wondering whether the fact that it's a common law answer that's being proposed is is its strength because it's resistant to these kinds of insistence the insistence on categorizing and on definite defining in a way that a top-down rationalistic civil law type system is kind of committed to and therefore i was just just is there a sense in which the tertium elements if you talk philosophy for a second heart you mentioned hearts you mentioned the penumbra or the gray areas is this not an example of a penumbral case of I was going to, this is the question I'll put to you, more of a, um, a, a thing in possession than a thing in action, because you sort of hinted that it's in the middle. But I'm, I just want to ask you, are, isn't it really more the one? Isn't it really more the propriety? It's just that it's a penumbral case in the Harshan sense. And now we're going to pick out which elements of it we're going to say are appropriate for this and stop and, and, and not go further. And the answer to the gentleman in the front is, you've got to convince an English judge that your share capital can be, that, that's the whole point of common law, you've got to convince the judges to give you this remedy or to do this, uh, that's not going to happen if it's going to cause disruption. It's, this is an incremental common law, beautiful common law thing, isn't it, where it's done slowly, carefully, and a bit at a time. Does, doesn't the common law have massive advantages in a sort of jurisdictional competition in that case um, over, over other sort of civil systems? Yeah, so that's exactly the, the position that we arrived at. Um, as I said, it was partly thinking about just how horrendous it would be to try and um, draft any sort of legislation that encompassed 
not just, of course, it's not just about classification, but then you've got to think about all the implications. Once something's in the tertiary crude, what does that mean? And, um, you know, what form does it take? So um, it's partly that, but it was mostly given that these things are, are, as I have said, not homogenous and it does it's very it's going to be very context dependent it's going to depend on the facts and the particular um, formulation of the asset um, it seemed absolutely obvious that the common law was therefore um, the best means of dealing with it, it could be most technology um, neutral in the sense that um, by sticking to the principles you can sort of plug in any type of technology and, and then apply that analysis um, and, and yeah, that's when we had this um, judicial roundtable, you know, we were aware that we were in a sense passing the baton, but providing, we hope, um, all the analysis and suggestion for what can happen in certain circumstances. So, you know, it's quite a long report. If X, then, you know, Y could be the result and then leave it to um, our judges to, to do their thing um, because... That's, I think, the most... Well, it, it also future proofs the, the entire thing, which otherwise, by the time it was drafted and got through Parliament, would probably already be um, obsolete. One final question over here. Thank you. Uh, my question, I think, follows on from the theme of unintended consequences, which is whether and to what extent your report looks at the environmental and energy implications of certain kinds of actors involved in certain kinds of uh, the creation of certain kinds of digital assets. Um, because I think you're quite right to draw attention to, you know, these are not entirely intangible assets. There is a real world infrastructure but sitting behind much of this behavior, particularly in the Bitcoin space. But that seems to be to bring in a question about stakeholders beyond the end users that you identified and certainly beyond technologists to <coughs> people looking at environmental questions. Yeah, and obviously that is, uh, well, particularly with Bitcoin, and it's mostly Bitcoin now, of course, since the, the, the merge. Um, and, and obviously that is a very important point. It's not really something, given the focus of our report on, on private law um, issues and analysis, uh, we, we're not allowed to go near regulation. You know, that's not that's not our thing. That's not our expertise. And and I think that particular problem, and it and it is unquestionably a problem. And you're right, particularly with Bitcoin, the the environmental implications are, are massive. Um, but as I said, that's really I think a, a regulatory question. And and what we're doing in our report is not is not telling anybody like, that you should go and do this or you should. Or, and we're not you know we're not saying these assets are for instance, always going to be um, a good thing. What we're saying is, if you transact and if you enter into some sort of relationship with these things, these will be the implications. So I completely agree with you. And of course, I definitely agree with you on that being a reason for um, pointing out that they're not, in fact, ideational because they have this very physical um, space in the world. That's not actually an example I've ever used before, but I might in future. Um, so so that's, that's my answer to that question. But as I said, for our report, that's not one of the, um, not one of the things that we had to, to think about. Well, thank, thank goodness, because it's a huge question. But ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're running out of time. Um, I feel that the conversation and the debate is just getting started, as ever. But I'd like to thank Sarah for a fascinating and stimulating uh, discussion. Um, and to thank you all very much for your questions. So thank you very much indeed.